This is Friends from Work, a podcast about all things in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's a podcast that's hosted, as always, by myself, Kyle Sconowell, and my longtime friend from work, Robbie Earl. And we're both so happy you are joining us today and listening. After a few technical difficulties, we are <laughs> up and running. Welcome to Friends from Work, Robbie Earl. Hey, thanks. Man, I uh, I don't know what the deal is. I'm a magnet for that stuff. But yeah, yeah. the internet. Hey. You know? It was invented a while ago. You should check into it, you know? Yeah, I'll uh, at some point. So, uh, Echo 3 and 4 today. Echo 3 and 4. Um, I'm really enjoying the space out that we did. How about you? I am too. And I feel like it wound up working out weirdly well. Uh, like the, I, I, it feels very much like these episodes should be bunched together. Kind of like the way we did with Daredevil, where I feel like it's like a one and two, three and four kind of a thing, yeah. which makes me mm-hmm. curious for what episode five is. Cause normally yes. we've got the, the six episode model. Remember how last week I said, we're going to make 2024 the best year of our lives. I feel like seven days in, I have had seven of the best days of the last couple of years. Literally, that's how high wow. I'm riding right now. And you've had seven of the worst days. So <laughs> this podcast should be a good uh, blend of the two. That's true. So uh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. I'm a uh, man. No I, comment. I'm, I don't like being the negative Nancy bringing in the storm cloud. So I'm, I'm ready for a, uh, you know what? There's a lot of time to turn your year around and it starts that's today. True. So Robbie. much time starts so today. Time. And I hope it starts today for our listeners. Make friends from work. Great again. Make election years. Great again. Remember make friends from work. Skate again, skate again, which I love that <laughs> meta joke. All right. Echo episodes three and four. So what's fun about this, Robbie, is I actually this time, surprise, have no negatives. I have no cons today. Wow. Um, I have three leftovers. And one thing that maybe Uh could be perceived as a con, I guess, my only thing is that I went back Uh with Annika, watched all four. Oh, Um, okay, nice. I understand that obviously the overarching plot is not life changing. There's nothing about it that's like I'm not on the edge of my seat necessarily mm-hmm. to find out what's going to happen, but I think because and that's the beauty of the Marvel spotlight and the adjusted expectations, I'm just mm-hmm. very much enjoying watching some content of a character that exists in this universe and getting more background on her story. And yeah. I don't have, I think, other expectations. And so that's not even really a con. Like, yeah, it's not mm-hmm. doing anything life-changing. I get it. But I'm okay with it. So here, here are my quick leftovers. On a second watch, the CGI stuff I talked about was significantly better. So a couple oh, things. Good. One, I think my brain adjusts on the second time around. You know, we've talked about that so many times. But two, mm-hmm. I do wonder if there's something with the screeners. Not even technically, I guess, but maybe it's just that it's watermarked. And so, like, maybe my eye is drawn to the center of the screen with that faded watermark, and that's messing up my background. I don't know. I think it's twofold. I think it's that, one, my expectations are lower. Not lower. Mm -hmm. My my concerns are more at ease when I watch a second time. Mm -hmm. And then, two, I do wonder if there's something with the actual screener. Uh, Alex, one of our filmmaking listeners informed me that maybe to the best of his knowledge, it's like a a lens and a lighting thing, but it does Mm. appear that they are actually at those houses. So whatever they do on a few shots, I don't necessarily love the creative choice, how it separates the background from Mm -hmm. the, the lead. It almost makes the lead person like move too far forward to me to where it seems like the background CGI. I don't think it is Mm. though. I don't think it is on a rewatch. I do think it's just a lighting lens thing. So it's less bad. And I think I have a little more information now on why it was happening. There you go. I do for what it's worth. And I'm sure it's different for every set that I remember feeling that about, uh, like moon Knight in particular, like the, the screeners just looked kind of off. And then whenever I saw the actual show on Disney plus, it looked way, I know that we've talked about different CGI things there too, but I do feel like there might, whether it's just the way, 
our eyes drawn, like you're saying, or if there's actually like those are shipped out before it's totally, totally cleaned up. I See, know. I don't think it's that. I don't think they would have enough time. But then I say that, and I still sometimes see that there are some uh, unfinished things in it. Remember, like some, like we had a couple yeah. where, yeah, where like there was actual like no titles, or it said like insert title here. Like, so oh maybe- yeah, yeah, the uh, yeah, Moon Knight again. I feel like they didn't actually have the score in episode three or four, at least. So not maybe the it whole is thing. possible. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think well, good. I'm glad I haven't gotten to rewatch yet, so. I'll take your word for it. My second leftover is reiterating something you said to me last Tuesday, which is that they do clarify that biscuits is impressionable. That's the Mm -hmm. word I think they use. And on on a rewatch again, the overacting stuff from the two characters I kind of poked fun of last time, it's totally not there. I think they're just trying to play biscuits as a, um, you know, like a lower IQ, impressionable person. Mm-hmm. And he's doing that very, very well. I, I think I'm I'm really in that back. And the villain, which by the way, you get more of him here. I think right. it all kind of fits for the most part. Like you said, it is a mustache twirler, mm-hmm. but it does leave more of an impact than maybe just generic bad guy. So I'm kind of reeling that back a little bit too, maybe. Yeah, I, I think I appreciate that it's not just like the the like stone cold silent, like especially in, in contrast to Fisk, who kind of moves into that position as the main villain after what Zane, is that his name? Uh, is, I don't know. Should, uh, anyway, I but know I, I agree. I thought here in episode three, not to jump ahead if you have more leftovers, but yeah, I, I actually thought there were moments where I was like, man, like you realize just how deranged this guy is. Like you actually, whenever I was in the skating rink, I'm like, I don't know what he's going to do. Like I, I genuinely, like this feels like a crazy person that has been like let off a leash and has like, you know, whatever power of kind of Kingpin's funding behind him. And so it's not like a, oh my gosh, he's so powerful and connected thing or oh my gosh, there are implications from this person. Mm-hmm. But just like in the moment, it's like, oh, this is like a, like an unnervingly creepy guy. So I kind of want you to keep going and take the lead here for a second before I go through my notes. But since you said that, totally. That's actually one of my huge positives. Not only him, but having Fisk back in play. There's something mm-hmm. about when Fisk or that guy are around you don't know what's going to happen. So like, I'm not worried that the world's going to blow up and all of a sudden, you know, everything's going to end, but there's a lot of tension just because of the way they're playing those characters. Like for two, for two episodes, I'm kind of like, Oh gosh, like I I don't like at any moment, Fisk may just slam echoes head into the table or something. And I don't know that. Yeah. No, I, that's exactly how I felt like on, I don't know if we want to talk about these one episode at a time or just kind of more You, you take generally. us. I'll follow you. Um, I just, I, I loved, so the, it was actually interesting the way that I did this. Uh, I had watched almost all of episode three a night or two ago and then had to pause it with like 10 minutes left and then came back last night and finished that, which, so I, I paused it before the Fisk cliffhanger so I didn't even realize that that was, that was coming. And I think whenever I paused it, I had still really enjoyed episode three. I thought the opening with the kind of black and white westerny thing. Was cool. Silent movie was really fun. Mm-hmm. I really liked the transition at the beginning of that episode from that to the like security cam footage that yes. was also black and white and squared off. Uh, Great. So like I, I liked the episode in general. The, the fight stuff at the skating rink was fun. Like you said, the I thought it was a really- fight was really dope was really it was really dope and a great like kind of what we were saying like we wanted maya to just be like a badass yep like normal person like someone that can just like get out of any sort of situation in the same way like more or less uh like some of the other kind of ground level heroes that i guess we've gotten in the netflix universe well another win there too they did it in these two episodes lean deeper into her powers they actually it feels like backed off a little bit in that it was mm-hmm. like, hey, those are just your ancestors helping you and looking out for you. I know, you it was kind you, of exactly really what you were it. saying. Yeah, which I still think I'd prefer no actual power 
You know, maybe you could do like yeah. a mystical. I think it's just the hands. I still, even if like the ancestors yeah. were protecting her and she had like removed her leg from that train car, but her hands mm-hmm. didn't glow. I think I'd be like, oh, that's actually kind of cool. Like she's channeling that strength, but it does feel like they kind of went that way, which is good for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I thought that once Fisk was introduced, uh, I mean, that shot episode three up for me. And then about halfway through episode four, like, because, you know, the whole first chunk of that episode is just their dinner and their conversation. And Vincent D'Onofrio is showing up in this show in such an insane way to me that I, it's like even having just finished Daredevil season three, which I would say is is like the peak of that character and the kind of nuance of his performance. I was like, holy cow, this is like the those scenes are some of the best like dialogue, just like tension filled drama moments that we've gotten in the MCU in a, in recent memory, I guess uh, for me, like just because of how well paced it is. And even the way that they're working in the sign language before she has the, uh, before she has the lens, but then after she has the lens and then holding her. How cool is the lens? Right. Yeah. I loved everything well, about the lens so much. Even the callback, like, or, or not the callback, but the the reference to it at the end where she's like, you wouldn't even need this if you had just, if you cared enough about me to learn to sign. So it was like, on the one hand, it gave us the opportunity yes. to, to have like D'Onofrio deliver those lines in the, the kind of like deliberate way that feels more Fisk appropriate than Fisk signing just because he is kind of the like, stoic still guy but also like from a plot perspective yeah it makes sense like he's talking about how much he's given up for Maya and how he's always been there for her but he's never in all the years they've known each other ever actually learned sign language and, and I freaking love the Denavrio call out because if there is a spectrum including all of Daredevil if there's a spectrum of how much Wilson actually genuinely cares for a person and Vanessa's a 10 and mm-hmm. you know, like maybe generic guy selling ice cream is a, is a one. Right. What's kind of cool is I truly think, and, and this is from his performance that echo like Maya is like a Maya's like a seven or an eight. Like I, I think he's doing a good uh-huh. job of showing that he does awful things and he doesn't know how to care for people. Um, even with Vanessa, it's weird at times, but there are times where he is actually trying to like somewhat in his way care for her. Yeah. And it's weird to us because it's so dark. And that's what I think is so cool because that triggers my second point, which is that I really like the way they're showing us that Maya is torn between two worlds. Like Mm -hmm. she has this upbringing from this guy she calls uncle that she really did like. She didn't have her father after a while. And like she, she was working she lost her mother early. She was working for him. And in that work did find some weird sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. But then she has this other life of this, this family town in Oklahoma and some people she cared for there. Mm-hmm. And it's this perfect, not perfect maybe, but it's a very good representation of her being torn between these two lives. Like, do I want to be good? Do I want to do bad stuff with Fisk? If I choose to work with Fisk, can I get out of it ever? And if right. I if I try to get out of it now, should I just kill him? Is that wrong? Like, I don't know if Maya right at this moment is a good hero or a villain right now. Yeah, really. I that's a great point because I was thinking about this last night. There, like in Hawkeye, she is. We know that she's heading up in some capacity the the tracksuit mafia. I think that because she gets a spinoff, I almost. I view that show as converting her more to like a a hero or an anti-hero by the end, but it really doesn't. Like there isn't a moment in Hawkeye where she's like, just that she's told to run away and I didn't want this life where you get away. That's the closest thing. But then she shoots Fisk. Like, is that a good guy move or a bad guy move? Yeah. I mean, I I think it's, it sets up like a, a truly ambiguous character and it stayed that way. Like I, I like that she, she is kind of on the side of the angels right now and that she is defending the people in her town from Fisk's folks. 
or at least was in, in that one scene. But that's not really, like that wasn't motivated by heroics. Like that's just, she's kind of in this, she's gotten herself wrapped up in it. So yeah, I like, and I, I thought Fisk calling that out was great because she has, like she's worked for him her whole life. She's killed people for him. And I, one question I had, and I, I, I didn't know if I had missed this, the whole reason for her break with Fisk, right, is that she found out that Fisk ordered the killing of her dad. Right. But that was way later in her life. Yeah. Is that in this, in episode four, does he actually address that or does he just kind of talk around it? Because like, he still I kept hasn't waiting said, for him to like, say, like, I, I didn't did. do that. Yeah. No, he hasn't. I feel okay. like they need to address Because he, he says, like, you were so quick to assume the worst about me. And I kept well, waiting I, for him to maybe like. Well, he's never explain. been proven guilty technically of that. She's only basing that off Ronan saying that to her and a couple of other like shady things. Right. But she's never really like confronted. Like you had my dad murdered. And he said like, no, I didn't. That's never happened. Yeah. See, that's the like, I, I because I would think like Fisk has an easy patsy with Kazi where he could just say, I mean, he's dead. He can't defend himself. He could say that it was like him going rogue and tipping off Ronan. But a sequence that portrays all of this really well, that really made my skin crawl, like made me feel uncomfortable was that flashback to Fisk beating up that vendor. Oh and man, then, what a good then, scene. But then calling and saying, I need a new jacket. I don't want Maya to, and then she's standing there and you're like, what? And then she walks over and kicks the guy. Uh-huh. Oh, that made me feel so weird inside, dude. Man, just made me want to be a parent. <laughs> Sounds cool. That's what it's like right there. <laughs> That's just what it's like. I, uh, Anytime Violet doesn't get what she wants, I murder the person and then I try to hide it from her. And, but, but if not, let her participate a yeah, little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah. Just uh, bring her up. No, her I, up uh, one, th this is like not a con at all. But this is just one of those, you know, every time it's like, I, I sense an opportunity. I feel like one thing that would have been so fun in that scene, but was probably just not worth the hassle. But if they could have gotten the guy that played James Wesley in season one of Daredevil just to be in that limo oh, with this, that wouldn't that have been, have been great? Yeah, that would have been a great tie in. Just to kind of be ground it in an in, in era. Which, by the way, I think the inclusion of the hammer in episode four, is that the first, like, actual tangible tie-in? Like, the exact hammer they used? Because, yeah. like, yes, in the promos, they did shots of, like, the 12-year-old uh -huh. boy who's covered in blood. Right. But I'm trying to think, I thought that had made it into Echo, and I don't think it has yet. It's only been Hawkeye flashbacks mm -hmm. and references. You know, like, Fisk says... My father died, blah, blah, blah. In this, yeah. in the, it's the exact same timeline, right? Like he says when I was 12 or he says something like it, like the same. Yeah. It's definitely referencing the same thing. But I just thought it was interesting to actually include the hammer because now I'm like, okay, that is yeah. exactly the way. And that's kind of a unique way he killed mm -hmm. him. Yeah, no, I, I liked that a lot. I mean, I, I think at this point, they're going to have to, like for the longest time, I had said, I thought that they would just stay sort of agnostic. And... You know, you could argue that they, I'm sure they probably will as to certain elements of the Netflix universe that just won't, even if they were good, probably would just never be picked up plot wise. But I do feel like at this point, if they ever wanted to show that any element of Daredevil isn't canon, they're going to have to affirmatively backtrack on that. Because I think that at this point, like as I, especially just as a casual viewer, I would think like, yeah, this is absolutely set in the exact same universe and timeline, especially because of something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. Like I'm, I'm feeling like this is a, this is a good tier two show. Like I don't, I don't think it's the best thing they've ever made. And because it doesn't have the overarching impact, we've talked about that a lot. It's going to be hard to get in the same category right. as like a WandaVision. Uh, right. But I don't know. I would think this is like a, I haven't looked, but this would, this should be like a 75% type score on Rotten Tomatoes where it's like, I'm I just enjoying that's a, watching about where it is. 
Well, like, okay, that makes sense. Because there's nothing yeah. bad about it. It's it's not going to have the impact or like a 10, you know, a 10 episode show or something. Like it doesn't right. have the time to do that. But I'm just, I don't know. I'm really enjoying, like last night I really enjoyed just watching yeah. something I kind of no, I There are elements about this that I actually think are, which I guess is kind of how I ended the last episode, talking about the spotlight thing. I, I think that I feel that even more now. Like I... I think it's really important that that as Marvel continues forward, they find ways to tell stories like this without disappointing people that are wanting like the next step in the larger story. And this is really the first time that they've explicitly given themselves permission to do that, which I think then adjusts everyone's expectations appropriately, and you're not going to have every, well, hopefully, if people are, are coming at it with good faith, you're not going to have this like, oh my gosh, this isn't connected at all. What's even going on? Right, 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 right. Like, so it, I, I, and I, even with Fisk, like, I love that, like, this is, we are not necessarily learning anything that we have to know about Wilson Fisk, at least so far, to continue forward. Like, I would imagine that there's a world where we end Hawkeye and then if you jump straight from that to Daredevil Born Again, you would understand like, oh, he survived the gunshot and that's kind of it. But I think here, this is just if you want to deep dive into that character and his relationship with Maya Lopez, like here it is, which is great. Yep. Yeah, it's funny because I saw a few of those visceral responses briefly on Twitter or when Greg shared it on Mm. Discord or maybe the newsletter. I'm trying to think, but, um, and I just now having watched four of the five, it's not perfect. It's not the best show. Again, I'm not putting it even in tier one, but, uh, it's just funny to me to have that kind of a response of like, I saw someone say, and this is a big movie reviewer. Like this is the most cynical show Marvel has ever made. And like, I saw a couple people like really roasting. I'm like, I think you missed the point. I think you went in with the wrong expectations of what you thought this would be. Like if you, like I said in the first episode, if you thought this was going to be like a huge driver for your YouTube channel or like for me, like a business, like I don't think that's what they're even trying to do. But I think yeah. these spotlight things, setting the correct expectation could be a huge win. Like we could just check in on lots of characters and not, not think like this is going to be Infinity War or like I have to build up to this. It's just like, hey, Here's five hours yeah. on this character you don't know very much about. And I feel like I know way more about Maya now to where like, yeah. one, I'm really excited to see what the finale does with her. Like, I don't know which way it's going to go, like I said. Yeah. Uh, and then two, I don't know where they're going to leave her character for the future. Like after this show, I don't know what it's going to mean for her. Yeah. I, it's so weird. There are kind of two, two things there that I've thought were interesting. Uh, just with like how episode four left me feeling one, it was that thing you and I were talking about in our daredevil coverage uh, on friends from work plus where like, obviously you're not like Fisk is a terrible person that's done terrible things. But, but on the one hand, like I, I'm kind of wanting, like, I feel bad for him in this episode. Oh, like my, it's just a crazy, like, I, I, again, I shouldn't, but it's like, I, I want, like, he so clearly misses Maya and feels like they had like a unique relationship. And it's like, you see that that is genuine. Like he's not, like he is manipulating her for sure, but it's not like he's lying about that. Like, it, like the scene, the very last scene in the plane, it's like, he really is. Again, it's like kind of like the Vanessa thing where you could argue everything he's doing, even coming to Oklahoma, is like not in not in the best interest of his like business enterprise. What what does he want her back for besides personal reasons? Like on that last plane flight, does he just want her to keep doing work for him in New York? That's what that was. Yeah, I think that that's a like that's an interesting question because I do think he's just like, I don't think that there is any actual practical motivation outside of just the relational component. Like I think that he is willing to, or at least 
it seems that he's willing to to ultimately give her the keys to the kingdom if she would just return only because of how much he misses her. Now, I think that like what her uncle brings up is fair, which is he thinks like he may even think that in the moment, but is there ever actually going to be a time where Wilson Fisk is yeah. willing to give over any, any amount of control? Like, cause he never has before. He says that, which is crazy. Yeah. What would that even look like? He says like, you have, you want an empire? You'll get it. What does that yeah. even mean? Like co-run it with him? Like Vanessa? I mean, I think, I think, I mean, he, her takeaway was that she would be like the queen pen. Uh, yeah. I think that like, I think it is just, it's such a fascinating look into that character. And I'm, I'm really curious to see what we find out in the next episode. Yes. Cause does, does because, Maya ultimately, ultimately even want that, you know? Well, and oh, and what I was going to say earlier before we take a break here is I, that was the other piece of this that I found interesting is like, on the one hand, I do actually feel bad for Fisk. And the other side is like, I'm not, I'm assuming that this is going to end with Maya ultimately kind of making the hero's choice and, and moving towards the, like the side of good. But I'm not even sure that I, that I want that. Like, I'm sure it will be, it'll depend on the execution and I imagine that I'll come out happy with it. But like, I kind of like... Yeah. I don't have a strong take one way or the other, but if she kind of took a step toward bad, I'd be surprised and pleasantly surprised. Like, whoa, oh, whoa. That's not where I thought this was going. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to do that. I don't think so. But it it, like... Because of the tie into the Native American roots, the Choctaw stuff, uh I think that that would be kind of Maya like slapping that in the face a little bit to then be like, that's my... Yeah. Maybe yeah, because because that is the battle, and and so I feel like if she and she, I, I don't see a world where this ends with her being like, okay, never mind, I'm just like, all all is good with Fisk, and now I'm just right back where I started, which yeah. is kind of what would have to happen, I think. We'll be right back. All right, so as I said, I don't really have any other cons. I'm I'm very much enjoying it. And so typically mm-hmm. post the ad break is where I'd share some of the stuff I have concerns about, and I don't. So I'll just reiterate a couple little things here that we didn't hit on earlier. I kind of enjoy the uniqueness of the title sequence, the Bond type title sequence. Yeah, yeah. It's so, it's so, hear me out. It's so weird and different for what we're used to. Like we haven't Mm -hmm. had the closest thing I can think of is black widow had one, but even then it was more of the like haunting and it was was haunting and it tied into the plot. Perfect. Uh This is like truly a bond type thing where it's a, it's a song with all the weird edits. And at first I was so taken aback. Like on the, on the second episodes, the first time it does it, I was like, what is this? Uh But it's kind of grown on me. I kind of appreciate doing something totally different. Am I crazy? Yeah. No, I like I I feel the same way. It it was definitely like a weird uh, jarring. Yeah. Especially because like you know, we've been coming off this Daredevil rewatch and it's like my brain is so used to like this tone being broken with the Yeah. But instead it's like a No, but I I think it's in general like I I enjoyed that and the fact that we don't have the Giacchino Marvel thing here where it's just like, I, I I want these projects to be able to basically do anything stylistically as like in addition to being able to do things plot wise that aren't necessarily bound in the same ways as like kind of proper Marvel MCU Disney Plus things would be. I also like that it gives it an opportunity to, to kind of get outside of that mm-hmm. box. I really enjoyed getting some emotion from Maya here. Mm -hmm. Really, if you go back to Hawkeye, her entrance is kind of the character that has a lot of it put together. You know, the cool, dope Depeche mode. Uh But it was always kind of like, and she was a little bit distant. And then I think because of all the signing, it's harder to get some of the emotion early on, I think, because of so much signing and less like shouting or talking. Right. I thought this chunk of episodes, episode three and four, 
were a huge step forward for her. To see her cry with Bonnie, I thought her actually arguing with Fisk where she like, st- or, or Fisk and her grandmother, when she stood up with her grandmother and said like, well, you left me here and you chose yourself. Uh-huh. And she like actually kind of said it audibly too. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. Um, I was fired up. I'm like, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I just like seeing some emotion from her. I feel like it's a huge, I mean, you sort of pointed this out the the on our first episode on Echo, but I, I think it's such a huge difference that most of the characters she's she's speaking with here are also signing versus in, yes. in Hawkeye, where, yeah, it, it, it is kind of harder to, like, there are a couple of really great moments with her and Clint there, but otherwise, there's not as, there aren't as many opportunities. And even when she's signing with Kazi, which, like, those do provide good moments, She's kind of always like, for the most part, she's playing the the person that's in charge that's not concerned. Stoic a little more. Like, yeah. Like at the very end, we get that moment with her whenever he dies. Which is one of my but, favorite moments. Yeah, no, for sure. But it's like we get, uh, I feel like that is what we get a lot of in yeah. this show. Yep. Spe- particularly in these episodes. The laser tag fight sequence was so cool. Not just the roller rink, but actually in the laser tag arena, which just takes me back to also my the, high school the, years the, and college like, years. Also, her blasting the music like that, which is yeah. such oh, a, like, and, and it's who the was same it again? thing. It's like Daredevil cutting the lights. It's like this, yes. I, w- but I hadn't thought about, like, it's such a, a great it doesn't affect mechanism her. for her. Yeah. Yeah. Because everyone else song. is totally is like it, incapacitated. What was it again? Was it this? Is, was it a Rob Zombie song? What was it? It was. Um, oh, it was. It was Dragula. Oh, it was so cool though. I thought it was like a perfect <laughs> fit for the fight. Yeah, and you're right. Yeah, the cutting of the the cutting of the lights. That's the perfect parallel for Daredevil. That's so uh-huh. cool. Um, I like her grandfather a lot. The actor and the role he's playing. The gentle yeah. grandfather who's seen it all, willing to take anything that someone gives to him, but then still has the positive attitude with his divorced ex-wife. Like, Uh I really like her grandfather's role. Uh, The new leg that she gets is super dope. I thought that was cool. Like, you know, like Miss Marvel getting her costume and there's all these cool reveals in these shows. I thought that was Mm -hmm. a pretty cool reveal to have a prosthetic leg that embodied her culture. And it looked cool. No, I thought so. Oh, And just the general, like... I really liked the execution of that. Like there were a couple of moments here that I think could have been really cheesy and yep. for the most part weren't. There are a, a couple of of like elements of the conversation she has with her grandma that pulled me out momentarily, but I think ultimately okay. I I bought it. Sure. Uh, but like that's yeah, like that's an example of one that I think could have been like for, for- a little too sappy. But I, for I like me, it was sort of done knowingly. For me, as a state of the union of what you just said, for me, that's Bonnie. Where like if I mm. had to point at something that I feel like is a little bit not working as much or shoehorned in, is they're trying to make this Bonnie relationship as such a big deal. But we're four episodes in and she's hardly been a role. And that's a good point. I'm not sure that Maya's even that bothered about it. Like I'm really liking her what is it, uncle or Henry? I like, I love Henry's character, oh, yeah, the roller yeah. rank guy. I think yeah, he's like not only killing it as an actor, but mm-hmm. I like his character. And so I feel more there that she feels bad for him, mm-hmm. but they're trying to tell me that Bonnie's the biggest deal. So, I mean, there's a chance for that relationship to be salvaged, but that's the one I would say where I get a little bit pulled out. Not the grandmother as much, but that one more. What um, What do you think is, is happening with the, like, like is her, is her grandmother about to make her like a like an Echo outfit? I think so. I think it's very okay. Miss Marvel ish. It is well, and, and that like there's a there's a there's a part of me that is a little like, yeah. It just, it, it just seems so like the. I'm a little nervous because we only have one episode left, and on the one hand, I'm I'm wondering like, the six to five change in some ways could wind up being really great because I feel like this is where, like if we had two more episodes, episode five would be some like, like largely a cutaway or background 
or like, and then we would come back to the to where episode four left off to finish things in episode six. Like that's often the model. And I like that they may be cutting that out, but I think my only fear is like, I I just don't feel like Maya has, like even that conversation with her grandpa, I don't get the sense that she's going to come out and want to like don a costume or or like, like she seems not that kind of person. For me, it's the spotlight that's helping ease that concern because for whatever reason, I have a very healthy perspective, I think, going into the finale right now. Like, I'm not Mm. going into next week's episode thinking like, gosh, they better stick the landing. Right. I think it's just, it's a different expectation for me. So now I'm kind of like, this has been a fun little side story. Like, I don't, there's not really a huge landing they have to quote unquote stick, really. It can kind of just be like a quick glance at a chapter of her life without really a firm ending. And that's fine. Kind of. No, I I agree, but but that's why I don't want them to yeah have a costume you know, like, reveal from the grandma. Yeah, like rush her into a place that she isn't. You know, like because I don't I'm know. I'm afraid it's, like they, it's going to end with the costume, the laser hands, and this like choral music. That's oh, she's made it. She's a superhero. <laughs> I I don't really yes. want that at all. Yeah. No, I sure. like, and it would just be so. It, it, it would be strange. Uh, to take the character too far in that direction. Now, if it's a if it's sort of a cabin thing where like because her grandma is talking about her having these visions in these life or death situations, and whatever the power element of this is that we kind of saw previewed in in episode two, like if it's something that like is not a like consistent thing, like like where Maya has like a power set. But like maybe in like certain moments in her life, she channels this. Like I think I would be much more okay with that because it would it would leave the character ultimately the, the same place. But knowing that like you know maybe she's got this kind of this deeper thing that would come out later. But I I don't want if we end with something where she's got energy blast out of her hands. Oh I'm, no! Oh, I am no. gonna be. Oh no! Unhappy. Two more things and a follow-up. One, I've been very pleased with the actual soundtrack, the needle drops here. I don't know mm-hmm. if the score itself has done a ton for me, although the tension music that's created with uh, whenever Kingpin shows up is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But all of the placements, like there's a sequence, I think it's in episode four, where, or maybe it's the very end of episode three, where they're singing in some kind of like church service or something, choral music, and yeah. then it's cutting to Maya like struggling with the decision and riding oh, the motorcycle. Oh, yeah, stuff. yeah. I thought it was really effective. It's and the I Oh thought, Brother, Where Art Thou song. And I thought the needle drop um, in the in the roller rink fight as we talked about was really cool. So in general, I've been mm-hmm. pleased with kind of the pop music placements here, which I yeah. think is really cool. Agreed. And then, uh, yikes to Fisk killing that translator. That oh, was what so a moment, though. Dark. Oh, my gosh. And that was so much back to season three with Point Dexter's girlfriend, right? Like, it yeah. feels so similar. Dude, that's, the, that's what I'm saying. Like, I really feel like everything we've gotten around Fisk, both from his performance, but also the, the story and the writing, is top notch. Like, I, that was such a great moment because it's him, like, in one breath, being like, you're ready, and he's kind of fatherly, and you're like, oh, like, that's, like, that's kind of sweet, and then it's just, like, she, and, and, and the Including fact that, the like, line of the girl saying, I don't know anything, please, just let me go, I won't say anything, and then they kill her. It's like, oh, come And the on. fact that she can't, that, like, Maya wouldn't be able to hear that, so Maya, like, it's just a, such an intense, very, like, kingpin thing to do. Again, so, like... He's so awful, though. That's the thing. <laughs> I, it's... That it is such like I, you feel bad it's for such an awful a good character. Human. That's you. You feel bad for that horrible person. That monster. I, I know. I know. But think about it. Like for a second, I was thinking about this last night. Now that it is fully in the MCU, and and taking Daredevil into account and Hawkeye and and whatever. Like, I really think he. Like, this is one of the more complex villains that we've ever had. In, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. 
Like I, I would feel well, like it would be on the short Well, you heard Brad Winderbaum. He said he kind of sees Kingpin becoming the Thanos of the street level. I mean, he should be. That's like, I just think like this keep is, him running in the background for five years, right? Yeah, yeah. As long as Vincent D'Onofrio's game, which he seems to really enjoy I, the character. I just love all those shots when you know, like the shots of him where it's just like the, his back or just his leg or just his silhouette with creepy music and then give us one little plot aspect that's like, dang, he's got his tentacles everywhere. Like the cops being like, whoa, 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 let him, let him through. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to show his face. And it's like, dang, he's I like running the whole show. That's the thing that's so cool about Daredevil. That's what, and that's what, what Echo has done so well that I thought Hawkeye didn't really have the opportunity to. Correct. Like, they right away reveal them. Yeah. And well, and they like, we don't get, we get really like that. We get a, a few glimpses of him being being like kind of calm, but more just like neutral. But but then, you know, we obviously have kind of the battle between him and Kate at the end. But I think that what we don't get there just because of the amount of time he's in the series is this thing that makes the character so interesting and in what he right. does all through Daredevil, which is this like really quiet kind of gentle thing. And then every now and then it just erupts into this like terrifying fury and you never know when it's going to happen. And that's what makes yes. the, like, that's the thing about that performance that's so like mesmerizing. When I said they revealed him too early to clarify, I didn't mean in the show because he doesn't get revealed till the very end of the fifth episode. But I right. mean, they revealed him to her in that, like he was already on the street fighting Kate so early. Yeah. You know, like yeah. and they, they could have just kept him from afar, what like they're doing here. And I'm with you. That's the last thing I want to reiterate. The fist stuff, the tension, it, it, it's that sequence that's so disturbing in Daredevil where his colleague tells him news that they, I think it's that they didn't catch Matt. And he goes, can you, uh, can I have your jacket for a second? Take your jacket off calmly. And the guy takes his jacket oh, off yeah. and then he beats his brains in and then throws the body out the window. And it's so hard to watch. It's so disturbing. Uh -huh. And it's like such an overreaction for what the guy is. It's not that guy's fault, but he has to right. take out his rage on something. That's the tension though that is happening here in three and four where like that's why every shot and every line I'm like, dude, he may, like he may take the knife out of the dinner and then just start stabbing Maya or he yeah. may, you know, like that's why it's so, and that's what makes it so genius. The whole time you're like, please don't, like don't spaz here, you know? Like he may take the yeah. hammer out and smash Maya's brains. I don't know that out of anger. I think what I also love about it is that like, when he doesn't do that, like the, the, he's really the only, because we haven't seen Vanessa ever be hostile to Fisk in the same way that Maya is here. Yeah. So it's really the Dumping first the time wine. we've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like someone that he loves that is, is. Hostile, yeah. Like because I, he, she's defying him to his face and we've just yes. never really seen anyone do that and not have repercussions. Like and he so, buys like, her her favorite cookies and she's like, eh. Yeah. It, it just like the, the like again. It's the like, what happened to the Lafette? It's like this like, yeah. and then she tells him, and he's disappointed, but he's just he like. Well, hopefully the cookies don't go the forward. way of the wine. <laughs> That's what he yeah. says. Man, uh, last thing, and I'm closing this. Uh, that lens to me is so cool. We started the whole episode talking about the lens. I think it's so cool from a technology standpoint. I don't think something like that exists. But what I love is that I have to ask that question. Like it's so mm. tangible and real enough with AI and Google Glass and stuff that we do now that I'm like, if that doesn't exist, that's a pretty good idea by the showmakers that maybe we are close to something like that. It's not, it's not like right. out of reach. In some ways, it feels weirdly like what I'm drawn to about Iron Man, where it's like the first yeah. suit is is not, it's not real. But you've seen those things of people flying and stuff. You're like, but it's not like so far away. You know, it's not Thor's hammer that you're yeah. kind of like, okay, maybe. So I love the technology of it. But it also ties into what I said from our first episode, which is showmakers tend to forget the fact that she's deaf. If she wasn't actually deaf, you would kind of just slowly drift away from that. Well, what a perfect mm -hmm. way to address it here, kind of covering their butt, which is that Fisk comes up with the technology so they doesn't always need a translator around. And just from a showmaker's perspective, they don't have to now like, they have a built-in explanation of why they're not having to double take or that he's not signing. 
Right. And so I just thought everything about that was really clever. And then to actually like not just show us once, but they cut to that camera angle like six times. Yeah. And it looks kind of cool, like what she would be seeing. I, I just mm-hmm. think the whole thing is well, well developed. No, that's, that's a really good point. I'm very much enjoying this. I'm looking forward to the finale. Before we wrap, there's one thing I wanted to quickly share, and it's something you've heard us talk about a lot, which is that right now might be a good time to look into Friends from Work Plus. If you're enjoying this podcast and you're enjoying the content, we are having an opportunity to, while these shows are going on, put out bonus discussion that are just straight up extra stuff for another Mm -hmm. hour, and it lets you live in this world even longer. So in this case, we just released our finale of Daredevil season three, but we have nine episodes covering Daredevil. So if you hear us talking about it here and you're thinking that'd be really fun, well, look look into Friends from Work Plus. There's three different tiers, $5 a month, $15 a month, and $25 a month. Uh, Gets you all different things. You can check it out on Patreon. But I'm also bringing that up because we're about to enter a really fun phase on both sides of the main feed and, and Friends from Work Plus because... You see this right here? This whole page of notes Ooh. is from X-Men 2000. Love That's right. That. I watched the first X-Men and took tons of notes. And so as we kind of start transitioning out of Echo, again, the finale is next week. Robbie and I are going to jump into award season. We're going to do our own friendlies, our own awards on this podcast mm-hmm. uh, for two weeks. And then there will be awards going on in the real world that maybe we can do some of those movies on screensaver. But then we start this really interesting process of both rewatching some stuff from phase four and phase five, but also building ultimately towards Deadpool and X-Men 97. And a lot of that stuff's going to happen on friends from work plus. So I am rewatching all of the old X-Men. And if you think that's a fun part of the podcast, like, believe me, I haven't seen these movies in so long that my first note in X-Men 2000 is I truly could not tell you what's about to happen. It's like my first watch, Robbie, because I don't know where it's going. Yeah. Like as we're watching, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that one Statue of Liberty thing. But it's Uh literally probably been since 2002, maybe that I've seen these. And so like, I have no idea and I've never seen Deadpool one or two. So you better believe that we're going to be going through Deadpool one and two and all of this X-Men stuff kind of leading up to X-Men 97 and Deadpool, both on the main feed and on friends from work plus. So if any of that sounds interesting to you now might be a good time. That's my last. And we'll, and we'll kind of be doing it in, uh, sort of a, a watch order because the, the X-Men stuff is obviously, I mean, it's it's defined by its messiness and that it's almost like the opposite of the MCU Infinity Saga. But it is still kind of fun to try to figure out the best way to watch those. So we're doing that there. Uh, also, if people are curious about that sort of thing in general, we have another. I think it's a collection on the Patreon, but we did this with Spider-Man ahead of uh, No Way Home. Yep. So you can also go back and hear all of our rewatches of the Raimi and, and Mark Webb films. So like in this case, we'll have a collection when we're finished of all the X-Men stuff pre-Deadpool. And then by the way, that will obviously come in handy a few years from now too. We'll probably eventually get back into X-Men again. So yeah, it's going to be really fun. Like I've said before, I've never seen Deadpool 1. I've never seen Deadpool 2. I've never seen Dark Phoenix, if we ever get to that. And there's (laughs) one other X-Men movie that I've never seen. Oh. And and all the Wolverines, I can't even remember which one's which. Like Origins versus, like I remember there's an Asian girl in one where he goes to a cabin one time, but I don't know yeah. which one that is. I don't yeah. know which one that is. <laughs> um, so it's going to be a fun journey getting my visceral reaction song. That one's actually underrated, by the way, but we'll get to that. Okay. I'm not making fun of it. I'm saying I should I No, 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 I know, but that, that's the one. I'm with you, but that one is... Uh, and Striker. I remember Striker a bunch in all these. Oh, Striker. Man. Oh, gosh. We... And, and by the way, I'll just lastly say, even if none of that is super appealing to you, it does help support Robbie and I. So we appreciate any of the help you guys give. Thank you so much for listening. This has been a really fun journey. We'll talk about the Echo finale next week and stay in touch with us and we'll see you right back here. Same place, same time here on Friends From Work. <laughs>